Uh, here we are in Victoria, British Columbia. It's January 26, 2018, and we're at the Site C uh, uh, Summit here in Victoria. Sitting beside me right now is Robert McCullough. Uh, Robert McCullough is an energy expert from uh, Oregon State, and uh, he is an expert on energy. Uh, and we've seen Mr. McCullough's name in the, in the media uh, quite a lot up leading up to the decision made by the provincial government to go ahead with the building of the Site C Dam, uh, which may be in contrary to some of the advice that Mr. McCullough has, has offered. So what I'm going to ask uh, Mr. McCullough firstly is if he could, uh, we, we know this controversy has been going on for, for 35 40 years. years. 40, 40 years. years yeah. So here we are in the last two couple of months before uh, the final decision that was made by the government in December. Uh, and maybe you can just walk us through what, what happened in those last few months, including, of course, your, your participation. Sure. With the new government, we had the announcement in August of a British Columbia Utilities Commission three-month session to review the Site C project. That was, interestingly enough, the first time the regulators had had a chance to look at the project. Very unusual by Canadian or U.S. standards. They did a very good job. They received thousands of pages of testimony. They wrote several reports. The final report came out at the uh, end of October, and the decision was very uh, supportive of closing Site C. They said rates-wise, there's no big difference. There's some big risks to Site C. Let's just uh, return that to the cabinet for their decision. And that was an interesting moment because uh, pretty much most people thought the question was done. After that, we had a couple of dismaying moments, one of which was two deputy ministers wrote a long questionnaire to the BCUC questioning what they had said and what they had done. Uh, it wasn't at all clear that the deputy ministers had actually read the report. And I responded to their questions myself because I thought it was appropriate in knowing that the BCUC might not be as direct. Uh, the bottom line is that the two deputy uh, ministers were raising issues that were not part of either the mandate the cabinet had given the BCUC or, in fact, were not well formulated. Uh, let me just take a moment because not everyone actually understands how these agencies interact. Pretty much all over North America, we have utilities primarily privately owned. In Canada, primarily publicly owned. Those utilities have a mandate to serve the public build projects, sell electricity and natural gas. There's always been a concern that the utilities would get carried away, and that's especially true for the private utilities who might build more than is needed just to maximize their profits. So for the last hundred years, we have had a regulatory commission, and we have those across Canada and the U.S., pretty much one per province and state. The Commission's job is to determine the prudency of a big project like Site C, and then also how the costs would be recovered. So it is a pretty straightforward project. However, in British Columbia, the BCUC was never allowed to have the initial review. So basically, Site C has never had a prudency approval. Today I gave a speech and I noted that we all would like to drive a Ferrari and if we go to the bank, we could say to the banker, I would like $400,000 to buy a Ferrari. The banker would do a prudency review. He would say, no, <laughs> you can't afford a Ferrari. How about a Toyota? Yeah, you know? how about a Toyota? That's not happened here. So the decision by the Commission saying that there was no real need for the plant and it was very expensive was useful, but it was not a prudency review because those filings had not yet been made. 
So when the assistant ministers, uh, deputy ministers said, oh well, it's, you didn't address this and that. The fact is, the rules had not yet been observed to have them do that. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot like uh, making fun of someone for not doing a job he had not been assigned to do. So coming out of that, there was a lot of concern about what the uh, cabinet would do. And I had been in touch with some of the cabinet officials uh, as part of this, simply because some MLAs had recommended that I call or they call me. And I was pleased to find that about halfway through the month, I was invited to come to the cabinet meeting. And that's the first time in British Columbia history that experts have ever been allowed to come to a cabinet meeting and sit down with a cabinet. And I was very impressed, frankly. So well, how long before the decision was made was that done when, when they were consulting you? On the end of November. Okay. So uh, there were six people invited. Uh, they made me sign a confidentiality order. I can say what I said, but not talk about the cabinet's discussion, etc. And that's very appropriate. That's yeah. their business. And I can tell you I talked quite a bit about these issues, about prudency, about cost, about ratepayer impacts. And I had a lively debate with some of the other uh, folks who attended. And in fact, at one point, I asked the Premier how tall he was. And he said six foot three with a bit of a surprise. And I said, well, I just wanted to check that you would survive if you were standing on the bottom of the uh, reservoir when it cycled, because the reservoir only cycles six feet. And I'm glad to say <laughs> that you would live through sight see, and everyone laughed at that one. <laughs> well, the point of the matter was to make clear that sight see is a run of river dam and not a storage dam. So uh, after that, uh, silence set in, which was interesting. I had some calls, including some from MLAs, who wanted more detail on this, but there was no further discussion with the cabinet. Uh, to find out what was happening, by the way, you uh, read Von ba uh, Palmer's right. column, and he is, of course, a very gifted journalist, and I learned more from Vaughn Palmer than I was learning from the official avenues. And so, about 10 days later, we got the answer from the uh, Premier. And in fact, uh, Vaughn Palmer had announced the Premier's answer two or three days earlier, which was very much Vaughn Palmer. So, that was disappointing in a couple of ways. Not so disappointing that the uh, political process had trumped the economic process. Oh God, I used that Trump word. Uh, dominated the economic process. That's not unusual. We're a democracy and politics is certainly not dictated yeah. by the experts. But I was very displeased to see the same muddle-headed thinking that had shown up with the deputy uh, ministers ended up then being the basis of the decision and being repeated by uh, the Premier, who I personally find very impressive. And I'd like to take him back to the United States with me because I'd much prefer him to Trump. But the, uh, the fact is, it's left us in a intellectual uh, morass. Okay, so I, I, we kind of got us this set up, and I think what interests me is is uh, is uh, when um, the announcement was made by uh, Premier Horgan that uh, they were going to go ahead with the dam. Uh, one of his primary reasons was that uh, the costs of shutting down were going to be so high as compared to going on with the project. Now, did you address that? specific issue when you were talking to them? Oh, of course. And both directly during the cabinet meeting and certainly in talking to other cabinet officials uh, before and afterwards. Yeah, so so basically how does the financing work? In, in, a, in a, say for instance, uh, had they shut the, shut the project down and, 
it came in around three or four billion dollars a bill had to be paid how was that going to be paid uh, according to the bureaucracy and the uh, the government how, how does that work well we first have to talk about the law and accounting practice and then we can talk about okay the, well, the let's, model. let's start that way on the accounting practice the assets are uh, prudent and they're earning assets by decision of the British Columbia Utility Commission. Now this, by the way, is not arbitrary. We have accounting standards observed throughout Canada and the U.S. that are exceedingly important. If British Columbia does not follow those accounting standards, it will be downrated. People will not buy their bonds because they will not follow the same rules as the rest of the country right. and the international community. So the entire issue of who has to pay is something the BCUC will address when the project comes to them for decision. You don't go to court right. until you go to court. When you go to court, then the judge makes the decision. Right. In this case, the deputy ministers jumped forward and all of that. But number two, uh, they didn't understand the whole structure. British Columbia Hydro doesn't have any bonds. Every dollar spent by British Columbia Hydro is financed by the province. You've already paid most of that money. It's already in your tax bill. And those bonds have been issued, the interest has been collected and sent off to the bondholders. Right. So when they say four billion dollars, that's simply wrong. Two point four billion dollars has already been spent on the project finance, spent, interest due. They also had talked about the $1.8 billion of reclamation. Now that's an odd number and no one actually agrees with it. Uh, when you reclaim an area like this, the primary issue is you take all the equipment, you go home and you plant trees. <laughs> so when Mount St. Helens exploded 30 years ago, we deforested in a humongous part of the state of Washington. Hundreds and hundreds of square miles. Oh, and in fact, nature planted the trees. It was so large. Uh, but we certainly didn't spend $1.8 billion on it. And so, as I've said a couple of times, the only explanation for such a high price would be if the plan would be to set up a uh, Peace River uh, Disneyland. <laughs> with space rides and the rest. Well, we know that's not the point. So that number, that $4 billion, is both wrong because 2.4 is already spent. Yeah. And uh, the remainder is simply an estimate with no real justification. So that particular argument was simply wrong. Moreover, you can't make those decisions on utility equipment without going to the BCUC. The uh, Premier or uh, Attorney General at EB simply cannot wave their hand and change the electric rates. Now did they, did the Utility Commission had nothing to do with uh, an estimate of the costs for shutting the, the operation down? No, they had come to the opinion of 1.8 billion and we, had, okay. we disagree with them, but that's okay, fine. I see. Yeah. So, and the commission, by the way, was very clear. They said, this is exactly what we need to decide when the time has come. It's in the order. It's, I believe, page 263, though I may be off a page or two. And they said, we've not made a decision on the various parameters, how much of this is prudent, how much is not, how long we will recover the costs, and how much right. of this will be in rates. They did note that they had used 30 years and 70 years, uh, which the uh, deputy minister said that uh, was incorrect. So the experts assumed for the course of their analysis numbers that the deputy ministers with no skill or expertise or authority simply threw away. Do you feel that their opinions weighed heavily on Premier Horgan's decision to go on with the project? 
Well, you're now asking economists about politics. <laughs> uh, we're not all that good at economics, let alone the politics. Uh, no, you know, the fact of the matter is I said that politics trumps economics. Yeah. There are job creation issues, there are vested interests. All of these things are part of our world. Yeah. And I'm sure that was part of his calculation. However, to state that this was driven by the regulatory decisions of non-regulators is simply incorrect. They also uh, announced their accounting standards. Well, they're not regulatory accountants. So they're in the situation where uh, the Premier asked the BCUC its opinion, and then when he received it, it wasn't uh, to his liking, so he just changed the answer. So yeah, they just ignored it. And we're getting used to that in British Columbia, by the way. The, the BC Utilities Commission has got kicked around a lot in the last few years. Um, now, I don't know if you've been involved in this, but uh, you know, we often hear of these mega projects start off at one value, and they tell us what it's worth. I think the, this started out at 6.8 billion, or maybe even less than the original. And now we're up to, I think in that announcement, we're up to around $10 billion. 10.7. It's gone up uh, $2 billion over the last three months. So have you been involved in any, any sort of analysis of where these costs are coming from? I have indeed. Not only in my testimony at the BCUC, but also in my upcoming testimony for the West Moberly uh, Treaty Nation. Right. So I've been through it uh, with a very fine tooth comb. So what do you think is, is driving these costs up? What are the major reasons? Well, the first is, of course, we have landslide problems on the left bank. And the left bank is where the major equipment is going to be installed. Most importantly, the diversion tunnels, which will empty the river at a critical moment and allow us to build the dam. Because as any child who has ever built a sand castle will tell you, if you try to build the sand castle when the tide is coming in, it falls down. Yeah. So we have to wait for the tide to go out. Yeah. In this case, what we do is we build uh, temporary dams and we redirect the water. Yeah. Then the area where we need to build the dam is dry. Yeah. Then we go ahead and build the dam. And that's normally not a big issue. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's not a exciting issue, except in this one case, the left bank is quite unstable, and they had the risk of two landslides so far this year. Having gone through the more recent engineering studies, I can tell you that is a continuing concern. Mm -hmm. And they're very worried that there might be a further landslide risk. Is that that's just due to the makeup of the soil on that? It's God's fault. Okay. God did not build a very good <laughs> uh, river area for a dam. And yeah. uh, the fact is, if you're an experienced hydroelectric developer like Hydro-Quebec, uh, you're better at this than if you're inexperienced. And it's been 20 years since BC Hydro has done this, and there's a learning curve. So now we, okay, yeah. Uh, What's that, a billion, uh, throw a billion on there, uh, two billion, how does it all, how do they put just, those numbers on just, that? Just two billion, it's nothing yeah. much. And so, BC Hydro has given several estimates. They are inconsistent, they're not well documented, that's been part of the problem all along. First is 610 million directly for the two tension cracks, in other words, landslides. And then after that, uh, when we talked at the cabinet, the cabinet officer uh, directed us to use 10 billion. So at that point, we had added another large quanta to this, right. about another $700 million. And then the next stage was uh, the Premier himself used $10.7 billion. So we ended up with $1.4 billion after the BC Hydro estimate of what the landslides right. had cost. Uh, two explanations for that, one of which is some real concern about other geotechnical uh, obstacles. Uh, if so, that's very realistic. 
but also uh, from comments made by the uh, Deputy Minister of the Cabinet, uh, Don Wright, in a uh, paper he wrote, it indicates that part of that might have been a problem with the bids for the next stage of the project. And again, this is an inexperienced problem. Uh, when you start a project and then later on take intermediate bids, yeah, you have lost your negotiating leverage. Yeah. So, so yeah, you walk into the car dealership. Your wife says that's the car. Yeah. Then you say to the salesman, "We're going to dick her." Well, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> so we committed ourselves before those bids came in, and I suspect the bids were quite a bit higher than they might have been if yeah. they'd taken the bids. And then later on announced okay. what they were going ahead. So, in, in your view, these uh, tension cracks that are in this in this uh, left bank of the of the of the uh, reservoir, is it a solvable? Is it a solvable, or is it a possibility they won't be able to solve that? More likely, what's going to happen is that they may find another one. Yeah. Now, here's now we're into the economics of heavy construction, which yeah. isn't obvious to everyone. When you're building a project like this, you have to, in fact, have a critical path. Yeah. And that is a term defined by the U.S. military and a construction methodology that many people use. And the critical path for this project is, first you excavate the left bank, then you build the diversion structures, mm -hmm. then you clear the water off the dam area, then you build the dam. That's the path. Yeah. Everything else you're doing is important, but it is not on the critical path. Yeah. So we had the avalanche risk. That took us off the critical path by a full year. Because of meteorology and river operations, we have to start the diversion process by September. If we miss five days and that we bounce to the next year and why is that well it gets too cold to construct things in midwinter and it gets too wet in the spring yeah and so you just wouldn't be able to succeed so water levels go down in the summertime right so you have a situation where you would like to be uh, building that dam the actual yeah. dam part of the dam uh, at the appropriate part of the year when you can divert enough water to keep it the area right. construction dry. Well, went to a child building in Sandcastle with the tide going in. So what that means is that if we have another tension crack in this area, uh, we will actually be forced into another major delay. Yeah. Another major delay means that they will be bounced out yet another year into the future. Yeah. With all of the costs of combat, which are, of course, inflation, but also interest on all the costs already committed. Yeah. So that'll be pretty pricey. Now that could well end the project because going to the premier and the cabinet and saying, yes, we were off by $2 billion, but we promised never to never do this again. Yeah. Uh, that works once, but uh, fool me once, it's your fault. Fool yeah. me twice, it's my fault. They'd have to face the fact that the, this well, might you know, not I, work. I, I think time. for most British Columbians, I mean, uh, most reasonable people, you know, would look at projects and I like your common sense approach to like how you, how you go buy a car and, and uh, you know, you, 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 there are certain economic issues that you can't escape about this automobile and, and what you need it for and and how long it's going to last and it's all these same questions. And whether you should bring your uh, very enthusiastic partner to announce she, <laughs> yeah. he or she wants the car before you negotiate the price. Those, those are problems. But uh, in the end, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in a broader picture, uh, there's risks involved in every economic decision. Here, here we have uh, the government taking a fairly major risk here on this dam. There are some uh, intangibles that could really, as you say, it could, it could stop the project. Um, and uh, the economic incentive, let's say, for taking this risk, like if the province thought, okay, you know, if we get this thing built, we're going to make some money. 
we're gonna we're gonna sell some electricity and you know we're we're going to be doing very well. Do you think it's possible that that they can actually sell electricity from the building of that dam that that would actually pay for the dam? I mean, in say in a, in a matter of twenty years or twenty five years, is there a possibility it would actually pay for itself? No. Number one, this is a 40-year-old project. It's obsolete in our current technological world. Number two, uh, 10 years ago I was in front of the U.S. Senate uh, talking about oil prices when the price of oil hit $150. By the end of the year, the price was down to $30. It's cycled in the $50 range ever since. What happened is, we learned how to find oil and natural gas. Yeah. And now the U.S. and Canada are the largest producers in the world, which is, seems outlandish to everyone. We'd heard about peak oil. Yeah. Well, the rules changed. Yeah. Some engineers whose names we don't remember figured out how to do this. The same thing has occurred with solar and electricity. We, the costs of those have been reduced by at least 50% over the last five years. And a few weeks ago in the Colorado RFP, we received 50,000 megawatts. Now that's 10 times as much power as all of British Columbia uses of wind offers at $18 US, which is something like a quarter of the price of Site C. And now that's the offers to build? Yes, that's a okay. real life offer. You say yes, and they bring their truck over and they start working. Yeah. Now why is that? Well, those are assembly line products. We are very good at assembly lines. Yeah. You make enough wind turbines, you get good at making wind turbines. You yeah. make enough solar panels, you get good at making solar panels. One-off projects like Site C, you don't have that experience. You don't have that yeah. level of improvement. In fact, Site C, as I noted, some of their problems have just been inexperienced. Yeah. So what has happened at the price of power in our area of the world? The largest market of the world for wholesale electricity is the mid Columbia market. Strangely enough, that's okay. midway up the Columbia yeah. and just south of the Canadian border. The price this year was the lowest price in history. The price next year from the forward markets on Wall Street is even lower. That's the price remarkable. of natural gas is scheduled to stay at the same level in real terms for the next decade. Our reserves of natural gas are an all-time high. We have a tremendous amount of new resources coming online, which continue to depress the price. So, can I take a 40-year-old car and win a car race with people who uh, have new technology? Not very often. Mm -hmm. And believe me, this is no Rolls Royce. It only leaves one. The big question is, of course, is that all the technical advice uh, the geotechnical concerns and all the economic advice and concerns and 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 with people that know what they're doing uh, that have seen these trends before, especially the economic trends, can see that really there's not much money in this uh, in this, in selling electricity right now or in the next couple of decades. So. Um, if, if, if the rest of British Columbia is like me, we're still stuck with the question of why. Why would they build it? And, I, and, and I, what, I, what we're trying to establish today is it isn't because of uh, it's, a, it's a such a lucrative market that they just had to go ahead and, and, and build it. It doesn't seem to be because of, uh, of any other concern uh, for a shortage of electricity for consumers locally. Um, so we're still stuck with that question. The evidence all tends to point towards that they had priorities over and above these priorities. And um, we're still looking for them what they are. <laughs> well, the fact is we live in democracies and democracies have different dynamics. There's a tremendous inertia in political affairs. 
and I have talked to many elected officials and I'm always amazed at how far behind the curve they can be. This tremendous change in technology that's occurred over the last decade has left our political process completely in the dark. It is completely in, yeah, just... Our astonishingly, embarrassingly, yeah. hopelessly lost president, uh, Mr. Trump, he was trying to get the regulatory authorities in the east coast of the U.S. to subsidize aging coal units. Now, the part of this is hilarious because, number one, we're very worried about coal for environmental yeah. reasons. But worse than that, these are 50 years old. Think about getting parts for your 50-year-old VCR. Yeah. When one of those plants breaks, and they break all the time, you have to build the parts from scratch. It's yeah. a one each. And it's not a bracket. It's not a little screw. Yeah. It is a huge machine the size of this building, and you are finding parts for it. We have a client that just closed their coal unit in Indiana. They didn't close it because they didn't like coal. I mean, they're in Indiana. They love yeah. coal. They closed it because they couldn't keep it working because it was too old. Interesting. So here he is, he wants to subsidize this. Yeah. Well, the regulators turned him down. I'm sure he's now angry with them too. He uh, has tried a number of equally foolish things. Yeah. And of course, he's easy to make fun of because we don't think he's a thoughtful individual. But there are mistakes so evocative that we make them again and again. And I always give the example of Iraq. So uh, England and America and Canada have invaded Iraq five times in the last hundred years. And we're very good at it. I mean, there's, there's no question that if we're going to invade anywhere, it would be Iraq. And the British invaded twice. Commonwealth invaded twice in the First World War alone. I mean, that was uh, pretty impressive. And once in the Second World War, and then two more times more recently. Why do we keep invading Iraq? Well, we have a good reason every time. And obviously, the last few times, we had an evil dictator. Uh, no question he was evil. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is, every time we invade Iraq, we end up in charge of Iraq. Yeah. We hate being in charge of Iraq. It has nothing to do with our desires in life. Yeah. All we want to do is stay home, and yet we fall into this trap time and time again. So in energy policy and economic policy, we make terrible mistakes again yeah. and again. Uh, maybe, we, I'm just gonna, maybe we should wrap up on one more question. Sure. And, and that is, uh, you know, there's a... We're looking at the economics of, the, of, of this issue, and we're setting aside all the other values, the, the First Nations uh, concerns and treaty rights, fundamentally human rights. Uh, we'll set aside the, the issues of food security and all that and focus in on this economic issue, because I think this is the one thing, if, uh, if it's just impossible to prove this is a good economic decision, and you, uh, perhaps the government will give us what their real priorities are and why they're making these decisions. Now, uh, from what I understand, there's three companies that are doing most of the work in, on this project. And um, Two companies. It, one, just, immediate, one immediately went bankrupt. Okay, one immediately went bankrupt. So now we have two companies. Uh, I know one of which is a checkered history. I don't know well, that's the newest bid. Yeah. So the main commercial works had three uh, bidders yeah. that we hired. One immediately went bankrupt. So now we're on the second round of bids. Okay. And that's where the uh, ACOM, the uh, firm that's been purchased by the Chinese. That's, that's right. And I'm not an expert on that. I'm, I don't know much about the Chinese company. Yeah. I do know that the first round of bids indicated a level of inexperience at BC Hydro because when you do a big RFP, which I have yeah. done, first thing you do is due diligence on the bidders. Yeah. Uh, before you marry the woman, you do actually like to uh, 
meet with her and talk to her for a while, <laughs> and uh, if you're wise, and get a sense of who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And in this case, they didn't do it. Now, they are writing invoices for their work. Uh, how, how is it, how does the, is it structured? Like, uh, the, the payment schedule, for instance, is, there, is it a performance sort of based uh, structure where they'll say, okay, we're going to, we're going to perform this, this task and have the project up to this level and then we're going to submit a yes. bill for that. Uh, for example, the uh, main commercial works have, uh, main civil works have a very, very long contract. I've looked at it. Yeah. It has a variety of scheduled dates you have to meet and discusses how you make changes and when you get paid. Right. And what happens if there is a delay or a court case. All yeah. of those things are addressed. So do they, for instance, get penalized if they're taking longer than what they projected? They, they conceivably good, but could. But we have a problem with BC Hydro, which is they've not been forthcoming. So no. uh, the amount of knowledge we have about their actual schedule is very small. Yeah. And for most of us who are used to this, we're more used to a situation where a public works project is entirely public. Yeah. So, for, ex for example, uh, in Portland, Oregon, which is a large American city, the Water Bureau bought a new computer program that didn't work very well. Sounds well, familiar. Yeah. I mean, it, it was yeah. just one of those things. There's nothing secret about it. You could yeah. look at the contract, you could look at the payments. That's yeah. the way city government works. We've had nowhere near that level of access on this project. Yeah, I, so do you think that is a problem for the public to be able to decide uh, whether this is a, uh, a project that they should support or not? Oh, absolutely. Let's look at what happened this fall. Deloitte, a very skilled accounting firm, uh, does a review of the project for the BCUC. And the first report they write says, we've looked at this and we think these guys are going to miss the river diversion date. Uh, as you, okay. I told you, that's a critical path. Yeah. This is not a, oh yeah, it'll be better afterwards. It's a, yeah. oh my God moment. So that report was heavily redacted. It was covered in black boxes. By BC Hydro. By BC Hydro. Okay. And the, yeah. Uh, so basically, it was sort of a tattered mess to read. Yeah. Well, uh, luckily, uh, Bon Palmer uh, released an unredacted uh -huh. copy of that. Blamed it on me, in fact. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, my role in it was very small. I just noted to him that it, you could read the entire report if you read it on Google as opposed to some other program. So uh, that really triggered the revelations concerning the landslides yeah. and the delay. And so within a month after that, we suddenly had the full story. Right. There is a tremendous benefit to transparency in public activities. We have learned this a million times. It is so central to our entire society, freedom yeah. of the press, freedom of speech, government uh, reviews, this is not news. Well, and often yet, you will see that when there's something not being told to us, there usually is some bad news that we're not finding out about. <laughs> so, was this a mistake to allow them to have that much opacity, which yeah. is the opposite of transparency? Yes, it's a terrible mistake. Fact of the matter is, you get the best job when everyone can see what you're doing because, A, yeah. You're very careful to do it right, and B, if you're doing it wrong, someone might help you. Okay, now correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't quite how to state this, but there's like international bond agencies that give uh, institutions and government ratings, uh, and you probably know exactly how to phrase this. Yes, there are bond rating agencies, and Standard and & Poor's and Moody's yeah. are uh, very important companies, they're Wall Street, right. 
and every major institution which issues bonds gets a rating from. So the province of British Columbia, I think, has a triple A rating at this point? That's uh, not a problem. It simply proves traditionally you've had good governments. Okay, so could it, could it happen that as this project grinds on and as those prices continue to climb, that that could affect our rating? Oh, absolutely. Columbia? Moody said that uh, last week. Just last week? Yes. So there's no question about it. The bond ratings of Manitoba and Newfoundland have fallen because they've done a bad job. Yeah. And there's nothing for it if uh, the province of British Columbia, which has an excellent reputation, uh, does things like makes major construction errors and doesn't tell people yeah. or insists they're going to set rates by not going through the British Columbia Utility Commission or a dozen other things that will get identified by the bond raters as a risk. So in, in fact, uh, that uh, Premier Horgan has used the argument that, uh, that we should go ahead with the project because of his concerns with our ratings. And this may turn around to be that we, our ratings could be reduced or, or we could have lower ratings because of the project that he's going ahead with. Let's think about what their interest is. It's very, very simple. These guys do not want you to spend too much money compared to your income. Yeah. Moody's is exactly like the banker you go to on your Ferrari. Yeah. If you ask Moody's, I'm going to spend a lot of money foolishly, they are going to say it's risky. If you say to Moody's, we're not going to spend the money, they're going to be relieved. They want as sober, as common sense, as transparent a process as possible. The one argument that the deputy ministers made was, oh, if we admit that it's going nowhere, we'll have an honoring asset and Moody's will be unhappy. Uh, that's the exact opposite of how a bond rating would firm yeah. a view this. They would say, you've admitted that it was a bad estimate and you stopped. Yeah. Great. If you would say to them, it's a bad estimate, and we went on just to make sure you would not be unhappy with you. That'll get you quite a shake of the head, and that's a bit of what happened with the last Moody's rating. Okay, so that pretty well clarifies that. So, Mr. Ricala, uh, there's so many other aspects of this project, and, it, and all the other issues that fan out from this project. That I'm sure there's going to be lots more uh, opportunity in, in the future when you may be around here and your, your expertise is going to be needed again. Well, I, I am likely to be a witness in the upcoming West Moberly uh, trial. Which, okay. And that's uh, mission, I believe, in the near future. Though that's the lawyer's issue, not okay. the witness. Okay. Thank you so much for coming in. It was a pleasure. It's, you did a very good job. I don't know why they were doubting you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would like to state for the record that he did a very good job. <laughs>